Thank you for tuning into Beyond the Headlines. Today we'll be discussing diversity in public policy. In order to develop people-centered policies, programs, and services, we must ensure that the values and the practices of our leaders and employees are open and inclusive. Consequently, it is necessary to carve spaces for diversity and inclusion in order to arrive at innovative ideas and approaches to solving problems. Today we'll be discussing how diversity fosters better policy in the context of institutions such as public policy at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Our panel includes myself, Hiba, Sarah Habiba, Faisal Mehboob, one of the directors of the Gender Diversity and Public Policy Initiative, as well as Antona Christus Ranjan, equity advisor of the MPP program. So as analysts of the Gender and Diversity and Public Policy Initiative, I think it's a great idea to start with what diversity and inclusion means to us. So Sarah and Habiba, what do you think diversity and inclusion means to us? So to me, diversity and inclusion goes far beyond the superficial level that most of us look at diversity and inclusion, and that is just looking at different races and different ethnicities. I believe diversity and inclusion also takes into consideration individuals who come from different educational backgrounds or um, individuals who have lived through different experiences, whether that may be in their personal lives or in the workplace. I agree with that. I also think that diversity and and inclusion should be looked as as also moving beyond tolerance and having people actually truly represented, whether it's disability, mental health, race, so on. But also, like you said, having diverse people with diverse backgrounds, bringing all these thoughts in the institution and in the field broadly. So we need to have diversity and inclusion that's actually representative, that goes beyond tokenism, that actually impacts actual change that we want to see. And we need to make sure that that starts off here, whether at the University of Toronto or other campuses, but also that that transfers onto the public policy field and to make sure that it's always there and something that's at the forefront. So to me, diversity and inclusion in public policy should never be an afterthought. It should be taken into consideration during every step of policymaking. And as Sarah mentioned, um, diversity should have put importance to intersectionality lens. Um, So, you know, taking into consideration not only gender and race, but social identities um, that goes beyond what people usually think think of when we say diversity. And... Also, in order to have diversity and inclusion in, in the workplace, uh, it's important to have a diverse public policy makers. So you not only go in there with knowledge, but you also go in there with lived experiences. I would have to definitely agree with what Antona said. To me, diversity and inclusion is, they're inextricably linked, but the way I see it is that it's a process. So. Diversity um, in and of itself to me means that there's a presence of differences. So that includes physical difference, um, biological difference, a difference in your educational background, and most importantly, and I say that with a greater emphasis, most importantly, it's a difference in lived experiences. Um, I think there's a lot to be said that um, diversity is goes beyond what we physically look like and represent, although that's a big part of it, but how we were brought up, the types of challenges or barriers or just the life that we've lived is so unique and bringing that into whether it be public policy or any field of work has so much value because we're all completely different um, and addressing the needs of our clients, whether that be citizens through public policy or whether that be through a business where you really do have clients, um, your clients are all different. They all have different needs, just like ourselves. So we have to take that into account. Inclusion has more to do with a feeling. So diversity is about the presence of physical differences or um, like I said, educational. So it's the presence of differences. Um, But inclusion is about a feeling, and that feeling largely has to do with being valued in a meaningful way. So I know, Habiba, you mentioned it going beyond just being um, in a workplace for tokenistic uh, reasons. But to be um, included, um, I heard this really great saying, and that's uh, women, when you're looking at women including them in a workplace, um, and said that women don't just want to be invited to the party. They want to be asked to dance. So that's the difference between diversity and inclusion, is inclusion is you're brought to the table, your voice is heard, and it's actually listened to. So in that sense, um, it's to me, it's, it's a process. Diversity is the first step, but inclusion is where I ultimately see us heading in the future. 
Thank you, Faisal and Anton. I think you brought up really great points. I'd just like to add that I believe public policy can only be effective when it works for everyone in society and enables equal opportunity for people to thrive and be successful. And additionally, I think that diversity, equity, and inclusion are actually you know, central principles um, that make effective, evidence-driven, and sustainable policy. So I, you know, I think it's essential to have in the workforce, whether policy, government, or any other field. So those were great points. I just wanted to take it back to Antona and Faiza. Um, I think you guys are doing a lot here at the MPP program, and I just was wondering if you could speak about how you create spaces for diversity and inclusion. Sure, so I'll, I can take a stab at this. Um, so as director of the Gender, Diversity, and Public Policy Initiative, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to take on this role is because I found that there was a gap within which we, what we learn uh, through an academic standpoint in the program and a gap between what the reality of um, public policy or workplaces in general headed towards. And that is, we don't have any explicit conversations on gender-based analysis and how to integrate that in academia or how to use that in informing our policy into the considerations that we take. We have to take into account that the different lies that we're affecting by these policies. So GD, one way that GDPP is doing that, is bridging that gap, is by creating a platform through a student leadership initiative to bring people together, bring students together, um, to put on events, to research events, and to inform others and create a sense of awareness and community to uh, discuss these issues. And it goes so far beyond just talking about why women should be included in the workplace or why people of color or minorities or marginalized groups should be brought to the table, but it's about showing the value that, they, that this can actually bring in creating meaningful public policies that are actually effective and part of that is taking a more gender-based analysis approach and understanding the types of impact that learning about diversity and inclusion can have in the workplace. So the equity advisor role is actually a newly created position this year and I was very excited to take on this role because it looks at individual concerns. Uh, So we're in an initiative you're working towards like a broader goal for this position, people come to you with individual concerns, but that doesn't mean only this person's concerned with this, right? It speaks on a larger volume. And I like how through this position, uh, I'm able to work with the school administration and the students, and it provides a platform for students' voices to be heard and for their concerns to be solved and taken seriously at the school level. So you both brought up great points about um, your respective initiatives and how they bring a lot of value to student voices in the campus. But I'm just wondering if you can also speak about the difficulties, because I'm sure that there are a lot of barriers and a lot of difficulties that you face um, day to day when you're trying to implement change. So one of the challenges that I saw through this process is um, changing the status quo, because the school is used to having certain processes in place for numerous years. So as students, it could be sometimes hard to just step in and be like, no, this is what we think. But in my experience, the school is welcome to have these discussions. Uh, You know, like they set up meetings, like they don't don't reject that right away. So I think it's great that they put an importance to students' concerns. Um, And it's a process, right? We, We are only here for improvement, so just, we just look forward to the future and um, and we just work together with the school and the students to ensure that everyone's voices are heard and we make good progress towards an equitable institution. I think for GDPP, uh, one of the challenges that we've had, um, there's been a few, so I'll pick one good one, um, and that is We do a lot of um, roundtables and events, and we try to make sure that we practice what we preach. We walk the talk, and that's to make sure that the speakers that we bring in are women or uh, people of color um, so that we're representative of what we advocate and what our mandate is. Um, But I think one of the challenges that we face is sometimes it, what happens is at these events we feel like we're preaching to the choir so a lot of those that do attend our events where as it's a great crowd a lot of events are sold out which is amazing but um, I would love to see a, a wide range of those who are coming so I would love to see you know white people Muslims um, black people everybody be in the room not just um, similar people every single time because what we want to ultimately do is reach and raise awareness to as a wide range of audience as we can. That's when diversity and inclusion really reaches its ultimate goal, if that's really optimistic of me to say its ultimate goal. But, um, you know, we want to we want to share these events and we want to share this dialogue with as many people as possible. If you're having the same dialogue with the same people, 
that's one of the challenges is to make sure that we diversify who our actual audience is. Thank you, Faison and Tona. So I just want to change the direction of the conversation a little bit and talk about something very, I think it's very popular and often spoken about. Do you believe that or do you think that workforce gender equity quotas are good and do you think that they're the answer to workplace diversity? I used to be um, very for quotas in the workplace and then I actually had to debate the opposite side and uh, now I'll say I've kind of tethered in my position on this and that's because um, looking at the data of places that have implemented uh, workplace quotas like Sweden, um, they've done assessments on what happens or what the outcomes look like. You would think that by having, for example, female quotas are what they have implemented. By implementing female quotas, you they thought that you know more women might be coming up the ladder, the corporate ladder, for example. Um, but what happens is that those women that are in the positions of the quotas feel like if they help other women climb up that ladder, they might lose their quota position. So it's a, it, it, it builds a sense of competition within having that quota position. That aside, it's also shown that quotas have a hard time creating legitimacy within those who've worked up to that position. So you might have worked your butt off in getting there, but if you're ultimately valued as just a quota, then you're there as a tokenistic view um, or a tokenistic representation as opposed to being included, like I said, in that meaningful ways. I definitely agree with the whole tokenistic point of view, uh, but one thing I would like to add on to what you said is on top of the gender quota, there's also an unspoken racial gender quota as well. So if, is there only space for one brown woman here or one black woman here? And does that does this create a tension between those to see who gets on like top faster, right? So I think that's something that we also should take into consideration because that just further talks towards uh, tokenism. So just stemming off of that, how do you think the workplace can be more inclusive? So for me, diversity could be improved in the workplace through firstly identifying the gaps in the workplace. Um, for example, sending out a simple survey and then evaluating that, then the managers or the directors would know how their workers feel about the work environment. So that's a first step towards solving any problems. Uh, for example, when I worked at the Public Service Commission in the federal government, uh, they took like a demography survey of the public service. And when I was doing that analysis, like through from like 1970s to 2014, I was able to see the improvement in that, right? So in order to first fix a problem, you need to identify the problems. So that's one of the broader ways of how to fix um, or how to improve uh, workplace diversity and inclusion. Yeah, and just to add on to what Antonio was saying, I think a lot of the recognition part of it goes with understanding what the term equity means. Mm -hmm. So equity in and of itself is having the recognition of the advantages and barriers that exist for individuals. Granted that we all know that we don't start from the same starting point. Um, so just recognizing that and um, being open to addressing that or working towards it. So implementing things that um, things that a workplace can do to better facilitate diversity and inclusion is doing for example, anti-racism, anti-oppression practices or workshops for all their colleagues. I would love to see every workplace, especially especially in the government setting, implement anti-racism, anti-oppression workshops um, as part of the onboarding package of new, uh, of new employees. I think that that goes a long way. Having a workshop like that helps you get to know your colleagues a little bit more, um, more than just, you know, hey, how are you? How was your day? But really know them. So mm -hmm. I think it really does start there. Those are great ideas, Faiza and Antona. i just like to add that um, when it comes to practicing diversity and inclusion, it requires self-awareness and the willingness to uncover unconscious biases that we also may have. Um, being women of color right now, I feel like we also could have potentially biases within you know, specific groups or communities, and I think it's important to be cognizant of those and make a conscious effort to be addressing, as Antona said, is identifying the problem and then addressing it as well. Yeah, I think that goes back to the earlier point that we started off with about intersectionality and just knowing that there is a wide range of experiences out there. Yours is not the only one. While it's valid, you should also know that people have their own experiences that they're bringing in, whether it's um, in a university setting or in the workplace. And you have to kind of take a step back, listen, and learn from them as well. And Faiza, just going off your point about equality and equity, I think it's also a really important point to make that diversity and inclusion is not just about having 
everyone be at the same standing. It's giving people the tools and the resources needed to succeed. So some people are more disadvantaged in comparison to others. Some people, especially in terms of social capital, connection, so on, a lot of people don't have direct access to that. And it's our job, one, as people who have access to that, who are here attending this program, but also policy professionals, to reach out to others out there and make sure that they have the chance to get connected to make sure that our voices are heard, but also that others out there get a chance to speak. Rather than speaking over people and rather than speaking for people, it's important to realize that we can just pass the mic. We can say, hey, I know you've been doing this work. Do you want to be present here? Do you want to share these thoughts and ideas? And then give people the space and the tools necessary to make that change. Sometimes it's good to be an ally. Sometimes it's good to take a sidestep back. I think that's a really good point. Um, I know diversity and inclusion is sometimes, it's like a hot topic right now. Um, So it's important for people to make space and not take space away. Um, So that's that's key to this this topic. I think, um, like you said, it's a hot topic right now. It's a buzzword, Mm -hmm. DNI. We're all shifting towards DNI and, you know, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it's a buzzword. I just hope people are doing it meaningfully with the right intentions. By, include, by having diversity and inclusion um, within the practices of a workspace, you can see increased productivity within your staff. You can see improved creativity because you have such a wide range of perspectives and lived experiences coming to the table. You can see increased profits because now you're understanding your clients in a better way. Um, you see improved employee engagement because people are feeling included. They love coming to work every day. Um, there's also reduced employee turnover. And it helps improve the company's reputation. And that goes with the idea I mentioned earlier that you have to walk the talk, right? DNI is great, it's a buzzword, but now let's make it a buzz action. And it's also important to take participatory approaches to make institutional changes. Um, and one of the problems is people don't recognize those institutional barriers, right? Uh, for example, I was at a conference earlier this month about education and policy. And we brought up this uh, questions like, oh, like people in Toronto are not racist. Like I walk around the street, I have no problem. But then that same woman who mentioned that also said, but when my son who started to go to school, now he comes back with uh, like complaints like, oh, they said this about me and that about me. And this is what they had to realize. This is where institutional racism comes into play. So that's something that everyone has to take into consideration before concluding that there's no such thing as racism. I think it's also because in Toronto, we have or a lot of people have learned to internalize their racist beliefs or thoughts. So there isn't really a, I'd say, a big platform for people to speak their voice in terms of that. So you see it in very, I'd say, implicit ways rather than explicit. And of course, there are extreme cases, but I think On the outside, everyone looks at Toronto as such an accepting city because of the diverse population. Mm -hmm. Okay, even when you look at the Toronto District School Board survey from last year, where they collected a race data survey, and it concluded that uh, black students graduate at a lower rate than their white counterparts. So this this speaks volumes, right? Because you don't you don't really look at that. But once you have this evidence based data, then you could kind of make conclusions or work on more policies towards that. And just to build on to that, in our school at MPP, we are actually working on a diversity profile. So I'm working on that with the GDPP analyst this year. So this is to capture the diversity of a student body at MPP and also identify the gaps. So this is a great way to first identify the problems, like I mentioned a couple of times, and then work towards a solution. So that survey will be coming out in the new year. So it's really important for us to have a good completion rate to, um, to have a good sample. I actually been working on the diversity profile with Habiba. So do you have anything to say about the benefits of the survey to the school? Yeah, firstly, I'll just start off and saying by uh, by saying that I'm really excited for this project. I see a great need for it. Um, I think it informs policy in a lot of ways in the school and outside of the school as well. One, like you want to make sure that your cohort is representative of the broader policy community. You want to make sure that you have a wide, diverse range of voices and that everyone has a chance 
to be here. I mean, we're all making big decisions in the future, hopefully, that impact a lot of people. So you want to have people who actually come from these communities, can speak about the communities, people who are aware of sensitivity, cultural training, stuff like that, people who can actually bring about change in a way that works for everyone. So it's important to make sure that everyone has a seat at a table. And one really good way to do that is to make sure that the school is capturing all the right kind of people, diverse people with diverse points. And if you don't have a seat at the table, then we're just going to bring our own chair and then we'll take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to bring it back to Hiva. Um, I know you're a senior student at the MPP program, so you've been around a lot longer than I have. Um, you've attended a lot more events, and you've seen a lot of what these initiatives have to offer. And I'm wondering if you can kind of touch base on um, which you like the most, what you saw the most need for, which do you think are the most beneficial? That's a great question, Habib. I feel like I would need a lot of time to actually come up with a great answer for that. But I think that as a student, I've actually been part of quite a few of the initiatives. So uh, in first year, I was in public, the Public Good Initiative. I was in Beyond the Headlines. And this year, I'm in PI as a research analyst, but also um, with GDP, GDPP. So I feel like I have have a, a breadth of kind of an idea of each initiative. I think they all are great. As we said, like it doesn't need to necessarily say gender and diversity explicitly in the initiative for it to have that value. It's just how you bring your values to these initiatives and how you work with other students and other admins and other professors and make it a holistic and, and meaningful experience altogether. I would just like to add that I do like when we get to do things outside of the school as well. I had the chance to attend the Future City Summit at Evergreen Brickworks and I think that's how you can bring outside ideas back to the institution, back to the school, and then have diverse experiences. I think, you know, a lot of times students have a certain lens, like we can come from political science backgrounds, economic backgrounds, you know, specific public policy backgrounds, but it's important to have backgrounds from psychology, from anthropology, from art history, from science, from environmental, you know, studies, like all of these different fields I think are so important because as policy students and professionals, we are generalists, but we do need to have a breadth of knowledge in all fields. So adding to that, I have a question for you, Faiza. So a couple weeks ago, GDPP hosted the Human Library event. Can you speak to us about that and how it provided an opportunity for students to learn about the sustainable development goals, but with a diversity lens? Sure. So this is a, an event that we were super excited to host this year because we got to do it in collaboration with the Intersectional Feminist Collective, uh, which is a Master of Global Affairs program uh, student-led initiative. And what this event was, was basically, um, if you heard of speed dating, this was the same setup, but it, we called it speed knowledge sharing. So we tried to encapsulate all 17 of the sustainable development goals. But what we did was we, ha we made sure that the, those that we had representing each of the sustainable development goals were working in that field currently. And most importantly, that they were people of color. We tried to make sure that we were as representative as possible. We tried to include women. And that was our way of weaving that, weaving that gender and diversity lens into it. While the outward focus wasn't necessarily talking about gender and diversity, but through intersectionality, it was ultimately linked because so many of the goals are linked to one another. But it got to the most, the key part of this event was to expose students to different types of people working in the field. And having that visual representation goes so far. And I'm so glad that it was a huge sold out success and people got a lot to take away from it. Just to bounce off of what you said, Faiza, we were all in attendance for the Human Library event, and I think it was a very successful event and very eye-opening and insightful, and I hope that we can take this event and then even elaborate in the next, in the coming years, and that students can have more opportunities as such. So we've reflected on a lot of personal and professional experiences today, and I'm just wondering, um, to kind of bring all that back together, reflecting on all your work, where do you see the push for inclusivity and diversity heading in the future? I think it's heading towards a great direction because we have people in our cohort or just people in general that's pushing for these changes to happen, right? We just don't want to sit and wait for someone else to take these steps. We want to take the steps ourselves and we want to bring these issues to the table. So just being open to having these conversations and being comfortable to step out of your comfort zone and have these conversations, whether it's with the admin, whether it's with the director. So my advice is to just never be nervous or scared to take your concerns to the institution. 
Um, so where do I see inclusion heading? I see it in three different ways. Um, first, I see it through allyship, and I mean allyship um, through people of similar backgrounds uh, with some sense of commonality so that you can bounce ideas off each other or help mobilize one another. I think that that goes a long way through whether you see that reflected in your peers, in the workplace, through your colleagues, or even in administration and in leaders more broadly. The second part of it I'll say is diversity in allyship. So, you know, as much as I love my brown sisters, I would love to see my white sisters and my black sisters also be my allies with me, right? I think that's where we ultimately need to see inclusion is we help one another reach our goals. And that brings me to, to my third point, and that is we need to make sure that we're mobilizing on our words. So DNI is a buzzword, but let's make it into a buzz action and let's keep that momentum growing and so that we can hopefully reach a goal that is encompassing of what we all look for in an inclusive work environment. Faiza and Tona, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really great speaking to you. And as you said, we've come a long, long way, but we have a long way to go yet. So I'm just gonna open it up for our final thoughts. So as you mentioned, we did come a long way, but it's important for us to build on that work and not give up. So just just keep pushing. <laughs> yeah, and just um, my final thought would be, I've had a lot of youth be inspiring to me, and I hope that we can do the same for one another, for our fellow youth, and work towards our ultimate goal. So with that, thank you so much for listening to Beyond the Headlines. Tune in next time for the weekly.